Welcome everyone to this, the final event in the Empress Art of Noises 5 uh, festival presented by the Electronic Music Practice Research Group here at the University of Oxford. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome Atal Tanaka, who is going to present an event uh, called The Body as Musical Instrument, a combination of talk and um, performance. Um, Atal Tanaka is Professor of Media Computing at Goldsmiths University of London, where he conducts research in embodied musical interaction, working at the intersection of human computer interaction and gestural computer music performance. He studies our encounters with sound in music and in the wider auditory environment as a form of phenomenological experience using physiological sensing technologies, notably muscle tension in electromyogram signals and machine learning analysis of this complex organic data. At the other extreme, he also studies user experience using participatory ethnographic methods in which the activities of workshopping, scenario building, and structured brainstorming lead to an understanding of a medium's affordances in bottom-up and emergent ways. But as we will witness this evening, Atal is also a composer and performer of live computer music, taking research out of the lab and onto the stage. He uses the data of EMG signals for musical performances in which the human body becomes the musical instrument. He studied at Harvard University under the experimental composer and technological innovator Ivan Cherepnin and with John Chowning, the pioneer of FM synthesis, at Stanford University's Center for Computing Re Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, also known as CCRMA or sometimes Karma. His first, <coughs> his first inspirations came from meeting John Cage during his Norton lectures in 1988, and he would go on to recreate Cage's Variations 7. Atal has carried out research at IRCAM, as Artistic Ambassador for Apple France, and as a researcher at Sony Computer Science Laboratory in Paris. His performances of muscle interaction in music and networked audiovisual installations have been presented at Ars Electronica, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, iBeam in New York City, the South Bank Meltdown Festival in London, the NTT Intercommunication Center in Tokyo and at the Zentrum für Kunst und Media in Karlsruhe. His research has been supported by the European Research Council and UK Research and Arts Councils. He was artistic co-director of Stein, the studio for electro-instrumental music in Amsterdam, and was the Edgar Varese guest professor at the Technische Universität in Berlin. So as you can tell from that brief introduction, Atal is an extraordinarily interdisciplinary and multi-talented person and I think we're going to have an extraordinary evening both of ideas and musical performance tonight. But before I hand over to Atal, can I also hand out, first of all hand over to our live audience who are joining us today for uh, today's events. Um, members of the Oxford University faculty and its friends and colleagues. And we, we are here witnessing Atal's talk and performance uh, live. And at the end of what will be about a one hour presentation, will be an opportunity for us to engage with Atal in some questions and discussion about his work. But now, over to you, Atal, and welcome to tonight's event, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the introduction, and a real pleasure to be able to present my work uh, in this unusual format uh, to Empress and the wider community. Uh, of course, it would have been 
nicer uh, to physically come up to Oxford. I remember fondly uh, uh, coming to Georgina Bourne's uh, symposium on uh, music uh, when I last saw Eric, and then since then, uh, a composer seminar. So, um, yeah, so today we'll have to do it by Zoom. Uh, as long as my laptop holds up, uh, juggling all the things uh, that it's doing. Uh, and the batteries don't run out, we might uh, still be here an hour later. Uh, if anything does, uh, I'm happy to be interrupted if I'm not doing anything or forgot to push a button or whatever. Uh, sometimes, well, the whole thing has become a television studio. Uh, I'm someone who actually would like to make an instrument or uh, site-specific work out of this kind of configuration. Uh, we'll, we'll, see what I mean by that in a second, uh, but the actual uh, kind of uh, smashing together of infrastructure and actual uh, creative work, uh, even for me, is a little bit um, mind-boggling. But um, so we're going to listen to some music uh, using a way of making sound that I've been working with for about 20 years. So despite the many places uh, that have been listed in my biography that uh, Eric kindly um, um, yeah, mentioned, uh, one thing that's been constant through that time is using my body to make music. And so I just wanted to introduce that idea. Hopefully I won't be talk too long-winded so that we can get to the music. But as a kind of lecture performance, here is well, not quite a lecture, uh, but uh, a little introduction to the idea of the body as a musical instrument. So hopefully you see the title slide there. And if I click on the right thing, we should probably get to the second slide. There we go. Uh, so since I'm speaking to a music audience, many of you will know the theremin, arguably the first electronic musical instrument where that um, incited the engagement of the body. We know its sound, it's iconic, and some of us know how it works. Essentially, by moving the arms in front of two antennas, we're making perturbations of electrostatic fields that change the amplitude and frequency of oscillators, analog oscillators. So, in some ways, my idea of the body as musical instrument Okay, has a hundred year history, at least. But in this case, Leon Theremin was using musical instrument and instrument building tradition okay, to create an instrument that he hoped would allow electronic music to be performed in the same ways that traditional acoustical musical instruments are performed. If we fast forward to the 60s and the work of the American composer Alvin Lussier, here I cite him because this is perhaps the first example of a composer and musician using physiological signals in a concert work. And so his seminal music for solo performer is the first brain music piece. And these days in the tech world, we have things like brain computer interfaces, uh, some of which have become really quite uh, practical uh, to use. We never quite know what signals it's really picking up from the brain. Lucie at Wellesley College in Connecticut worked with a biomedical scientist to use bio, uh, physiological pickup technology, electrodes on his head to pick up neuron activity coming from the brain. And then you see there on the little box on the right, there's an instrumentation amplifier that's amplifying the brainwave signals, then which goes on to set into resonant activation a, a set of percussion instruments that are distributed throughout the space. So what we see here in the title, solo performer, one person on stage. The performer, however, is sitting in a chair Brain waves don't require you to move the body. Okay. And in this photo, we don't see the rest of the setup. The distribution 
of bass drums, cymbals, and other percussion instruments that are distributed in the concert space that are activated by transducers okay, that uh, are taking in the signals from Lucier's brain activity. Moving then to Stein, as Eric mentioned, a studio that was uh, a very, very important part of my own artistic development. Michelle Weisfis was artistic director for many, many years. And he's really the inspiration, let's say, uh, for a lot of what I do. He created musical instruments that would track the movement of the arms and hands using sensors. So in the 80s, this was kind of a new um, possibility and new technologies that allowed real time sensing of movement, sensing of distance, okay, to be transmitted, converted to MIDI and control, in his case, FM synthesizers uh, of the sort that John Charney invented. So Weissfist with his instrument, the hands, has a number of sensors on these things that you see. Uh, uh, they are hanging off uh, of the left, a set of ultrasound sensors that are emitting sonar pulses from one hand and to be received on the other, effectively giving us a distance measure between the two hands. But he's not just got one ultrasound sensor receiver pair, he's got two each set up a uh, perpendicular in orthogonal configuration so that then the ones that are out of that are shooting off in the wrong direction won't be used but the ones shooting in the right direction will be used and in this way he's able to get a very crude but but quite effective uh, sensing of the orientation of the rotation of his hands in addition to distance okay there are a number of other sensors uh, there on his instrument some uh, touch keys by his fingers, and with this, he's created a live synthesizer performance instrument. I heard Weiss's around this time, for the first time on CD. He's someone who, who was a pilot. He had an airplane license, flight license, which meant that actually he didn't like to be a passenger in a commercial airline flight, and he didn't travel. I was at the Peabody Conservatory at the time. I bought the CD uh, called New Trends in Computer Music. There were a number of tape pieces. It was a compilation, tape pieces of, of the time. And then there was a piece by, by Weissfuss. There was just a photo that showed him a little bit like in this position. It wasn't just the photo. I mean, there was no, we didn't have the benefit of YouTube at the time to look it up. But there was something very visceral about the music. The electronic sounds were the, of a similar palette as the tape pieces, but it was the movement in the sounds that was very dynamic. They were swooping, crashing. There was something gestural, something visceral about them. And without having the benefit of seeing Weiss's actually performing, through a sound-only medium of CD, I could sense the liveness and the embodied nature of his music. And that's really what got me interested in this, in what, in what I continue to do today. So if we then combine what Weisswiss, Theremin, and Lucier are doing, to follow Lucier and use physiological signal. But if Lucier's joke was, as a performer, he could sit on stage and not do anything except think to activate the percussion instruments by his brain waves. I was, as a performer, interested to move a little bit and to perhaps get into that visceral space of vice vis. As it turns out, the nervous system is not just in the brain. It is the way that the brain communicates with the rest of the body. So brain cell activity okay, electrical impulses of the neurons in the brain are transmitted through the central nervous system, down the spinal cord, out to our outer limbs. And that electrical impulse, a pulse train of what we call motor unit action potential, so electrical potentials, 
going down the central nervous system, come to the muscle and make the muscle twitch or make a, a, a muscle cell contract. So if we remember from biology class, taking a frog's leg, separating it from the rest of the frog's body and applying an electrical current, the frog's leg would twitch. These days we're probably not allowed to do this anymore in a biology lab for animal uh, uh, respect and health and safety probably. Um, but these are the things that we know uh, can prove that the muscle of a, of a living being okay, can, does respond to external electrical input, okay, which shows us that in fact, when that limb is connected to the body it belongs to, the body is also communicating to that limb through electricity. That's the electricity that I'm picking up with the electrodes on the arm. Very similar electrodes as Lucier has to pick up his brain waves. But here we're picking up electrical signals that are causing muscle tension. Okay. So there are a number of interfaces uh, of this sort uh, that began to be built in the time I was doing my PhD at Karma. Uh, ben Knapp and Hugh Lusted invented uh, a device called the Biomuse. There were other devices at the time, uh, the body synth, and in Japan, Kahato's IBVA, which was a brain device. I worked with Ben and Hugh. Ben was an electrical engineer. Hugh was a medical engineer. They were looking for a musician to start to use this because interestingly, they had a vision following John Chowning's inventing of the FM synthesizer. We can imagine uh, this is a pre-web uh, era Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley nonetheless, uh, with a success story at Karma uh, like the Yamaha DX7. Hugh and Ben were very interested to make a musical interface, Biomuse, give it MIDI output, okay, and see if a company like Yamaha or Roland might not commercialize it. Okay. Never quite happened, but then again, 20 years later, 30 years later now, the devices that I'm using are consumer devices, miniaturized and wireless, and essentially using the same signal the electromyogram. So as much as the technology and the devices change, the body stays the same. And the signal that we're using is that very same electrical signal. So with that, I go on stage. I won't dwell on this slide because you'll get to see me uh, do it live. But I've, uh, as a musician, taken this instrument into different musical contexts. We don't as musicians, we like to play solo, but we also like to play in groups. And so one of the early projects that I had in the 90s was to create a band called Sensor Band, a trio of sensor musical instruments with Edwin van der Heide on the left using the hands of Stein and Spignev Karkowski using infrared sensors that span uh, the scaffolding structure. Okay that allows him to trigger percussion sounds. So the trio seemed like a musically interesting format for us to follow string trios, jazz trios, rock trios. Okay. We were interested to make a sensor trio and to think of these instruments as a family of instruments, similar but different. Similar in that they picked up the movement of the body without having to have external physical acoustical objects but different in that each had a different modality of sensing. Okay. For Edwin, the hands, as I described, of Weiss's distance between the hands. Okay. In my case, muscle tension. So the movements that, I, although they're both actuated by the arms, the movements and the affordances of those, these instruments are quite distinct. And for Spignev, completely different, a triggering instrument a, so therefore a percussion uh, instrument or an instrument that had the affordances to create percussion sounds. So he's taking the position of the drummer on stage. About 10 years later, I continued in a trio format with the second group, Sensors Sonic Sites. Here, working with Cecile Babiol, 
who used ultrasound sensors on the platform in front of her laptop, and Laurent Dayot playing theremin, and the theremin connected to a computer music system there on his laptop, and myself always on the electromyogram system. So this is now the early 2000s. We're starting to get audiovisual performance, and indeed we're sort of following that trend, uh, and Sensorsonic Sites therefore was a live audiovisual uh, band. Cecile is uh, working with the graphics in real time, where her arm movements are shaping the 3D visual environment. With Laurent playing the theremin, we've brought the historical instrument into the trio. And for myself, continuing on with the electromyogram, to say that that is my instrument, I'm continuing uh, with that instrument in new contexts. So I don't know what the next slide is, actually. Ah, yes. All right. OK, so here we go. So those are the musical projects. And so I just wanted to rip apart a couple of words, actually, before we get started. And it's not to be too pedantic, but um, these are some of the issues that I think we confront uh, when we're working with music and technology. And I'm going to try to do this in a fairly straightforward and simple way. If we take the word performance, this is the thing that we're doing on stage. As musicians, we perform. Okay? So that's the first definition that I've put there. But it, the same word is used in an engineering context. It means something a little bit different. In an engineering context or a technical context, performance might mean how fast your CPU is on your computer or how quickly your car goes from standstill to 60 miles an hour. Okay? And performance then in this respect uh, uh, entails uh, an act of optimization, making things more efficient. Okay? Whereas artistic performance may, is probably not about efficiency. So same word, different meaning. I'll add to that a third definition coming from the social sciences. Okay? And we see uh, the cover of a book by Irving Goffman, American sociologist from the 60s, a book called Interaction Ritual, where he thinks about or he uses ideas from theatrical performance okay, to look at everyday human interaction. And in early research in HCI, human-computer interaction, we were quite uh, interested in the sociological use of the word interaction. And here I extend that and stick with that same book uh, and, and say that Goffman was using performance, performance coming from theatre, as a lens with which to look at human social interaction. Okay. Instrument clearly is the other word that we can rip apart. And you've heard me refer to the electromyogram interface. Okay. So interface instrument, we, we may be confusing. But even to look at instrument as a word, musical instrument is the assumption we make. But we also have instrument in scientific instrument. Okay. And again, the same word is used in different ways. A scientific instrument is an instrument of measure. Okay. A musical instrument is, a mus uh, is an instrument with which to perform music. And we have a history of organology uh, creating taxonomies of instruments. And if I put up uh, uh, the stringed instrument sort of uh, card uh, there, that was my allusion to thinking back to sensor band as creating a, a trio of sensor instruments. But once again here, musical instrument, scientific instrument, the same word is used in different ways. In what I'm doing, we might have both aspects. The, the electromyogram pickup device, the interface part, is a scientific instrument. There's even a chip in there called the instrumentation amplifier. And with all that, I'm hoping to make a musical instrument. And this idea of musical instrument then itself can be extended or expanded. Okay. Um, 
as we deal with new ways of making music. So if we take a traditional musical instrument, the violin on the left, if you say musical instrument, we nod our heads. Okay. And it's, it's relatively straightforward because the violin is self-contained. The electric guitar is a musical instrument and we'll still nod our heads. Okay. But the electric guitar is never played by itself unless you're at home practicing. You've at least got to plug it into an amplifier. Okay. And we know many guitarists like to plug it through a network of effects pedals. So that point, where are the bounds of the musical instrument? Is it the guitar? Is it the guitar plus amplifier then? Is it the guitar, the network of effects pedals and the amplifier? Then it's no longer self-contained. It is a kind of, shall we say, rhizomatic network. Right? Or perhaps just an extended system. So can we think of a musical instrument as this network? Similar for a DJ setup, a turntablist as musician and performer. We'll take a device for music listening, a record player, put a couple of them on stage and stick a mixer in between them. Okay, a DJ mixer that's got the clever crossfader. Okay, so if we take this extended system idea, then we can say, sure, the DJ setup is two turntables a DJ mixer, and that's his instrument. But that instrument uh, with those elements won't make any sound. It doesn't make any sound until you put a record on it. So in some ways, can we think about the two turntables and the DJ mixer as a content-less musical instrument? Okay. So we have all these ways to try to map the old wor word musical instrument onto these new configurations for performing music. And the last thing I want to do is then take the idea of musical instrument and um, put it in opposition with the word tool. And I do this because these two words often get conflated in conversations of music technology. If you're on your computer, and you've been using Ableton Live or Logic, and people will ask you which one you're using, they'll say, well, what's your tool? Okay. But if we're performing with music and we're using it in an instrumental way, I wonder if we can think of these things as tools or whether we should confuse these words, tool and instrument. So just very quickly, if we try to rip apart each word, and this is getting back to the engineering performance versus artistic performance, we'll see this sort of optimization and efficiency cycle coming in under the word tool. A tool is meant to be utilitarian. Okay? It is task specific. A hammer does one thing. Okay? A hammer gets better when it hammers better. So it can be improved, it can be made more efficient in this cycle of optimization. A musical instrument, on the other hand, oh, well, music is not really utilitarian, is it? It might have some utilitarian music, but um, anyway, a musical instrument changes context all the time. A violin might find itself solo on stage in a string quartet, in an orchestra, or at the pub playing fiddle music. Musical instruments are idiosyncratic. The very fact that a flute and violin have almost the same tessitura okay, doesn't mean that the two are interchangeable. Okay? And in fact, having the violin sound and flute sound one button away on a synthesizer to be played from a plastic keyboard okay, do a disservice to those instruments, to the idiosyncrasicity of those instruments. And we know as composers that to compose for flute and to compose for violin, even if they might be in the same melodic range, we would never write the same melody for one instrument and expect the other to just play it like that. Okay? So there in idiomatic writing, we respect the affordances of the instrument. 
okay, and its idiosyncrasies. So in all these ways, musical instruments are really quite different than tools. And so I would like to bring this over to the conversations we have with the technologies we use to perform music. Yeah, so that's really it. Well, there was, uh, Eric mentioned uh, my ERC project that's uh, been over for three years now. That was called Meta Gesture Music. Um, but these are some of the topics um, that we tried to look at by using HCI methods, okay? But by also going on stage and performing. And that's what I'm going to do with you right now. Um, but the, uh, the outputs from uh, the Meta Gesture Music project are in publications, but are in also musical events. And there is an album uh, that we released uh, that you see there in blue uh, that you'll find on Spotify, other streaming services, Bandcamp, etc. And some of the music that I'm performing tonight is on there. Great. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. I don't know how long I've spoken. Okay. Wow, quite a long time, actually. <laughs> so, um, so without further ado, then, let me get to the musical part of um, what I'm doing. So I'll briefly introduce each piece. Let's see if I can... So hopefully the recording is still going. Turn the recording on here. Let's see if that's gone. Oh, no. Let's see, turn this on. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that's the wrong button. Where is the correct button? Here it is. Okay. So how do I keep an eye on myself while doing this? Okay. So the first piece I'd like to play is an ode to the theremin. And if I can find the right uh, uh, setting. Okay. So what we've learned is that my muscle tension okay, is going to control the music. And as a, way, as a simple way to get into it, I'm going to play an ode to the theremin, where one um, hand, one arm uh, controls the pitch, and the other controls the amplitude. And I will um, uh, page through three frequencies, frequency ranges, let's say. So it's a very, very simple piece. Um, it will only take a couple of minutes, therefore, but uh, uh, it, it's comprised of playing in these three different melodic ranges.
Okay, so that was called lifting, a very simple um, ode to the theremin. The next piece, in some ways, is even simpler because it's only one sound. It's, in fact, about two seconds of one sound, but instead of it being an oscillator, it's a sample. It's a sound sample of a wolf howling. Not quite howling, growling, I would say. We're going to take that sample, however, and stretch it, sculpt it, okay, and see then what we can do with a kind of photographic snapshot of an animal sound. Let me see if, oh yes, all right, so this, to get that, uh, And so with this sculpting, okay, I like to get to the very continuous nature of the muscle tension as an input to a computer music system. Samples, sound samples, we know are photographic recordings of sound, and we think of them as playing back exactly as recorded or triggered and re-triggered, often from keyboards. Okay. In this case, you'll hear it triggered and it will become repetitive at times, but each time I can hold it and stretch it and sculpt it, contort it. So that was Lulu, or the, or the wolf in French. One sound, but then it's shaped. So by shaping that sound, we have very different gestural affordances that are offered to me than in playing the simple frequencies of the previous piece, lifting. So I hope these sounds aren't blowing up your laptop speakers or that you've got something um, headphones or real speakers to listen through, especially the, the last low frequency in lifting um, requires some bass um, to, to, to feel. And I hope that Zoom is keeping the sync between image and sound uh, at least somewhat close. Um, we never know really, in fact, um, 
when the two media are getting decoupled. Okay. So if we were in an homage to Theremin with lifting, thinking almost in a violinistic way, okay, pitch and articulation, frequency and amplitude, or in the case of Lulu, articulating a sample, but then holding it and stretching it, okay? We're still in a kind of what I think of as a control paradigm. The muscle tension is being tracked, it's being smoothed, and we're using it to control frequency and control amplitude or control parameters of our granular synthesizer. But an instrument for me is not just about control. In fact, it may be about losing control or maybe about having a visceral co-adaptive interaction with the sound where the, the gestures that I'm able to do may come back from the sounds as they are articulated. So to get out of control in the next piece, we're going to get into a space of what's called sonification. And we're going to listen directly to the electromyogram signal itself. And then in this sense, the electricity of the body becomes the very sound with which I will perform. So this piece is called myogram for the signal itself. And what we'll hear then are very inharmonic, very unmusical sounds. So once again, kind of maybe challenging, uh, if not for your laptop speakers, to your ears. Uh, but this is the sound of the body. We'll pick up then different channels of muscle around the forearm to start to, to listen to sounds from different muscle groups. Okay. And we'll create a polyphony then of pulsing, clicking, stochastic sounds. Okay. Now this is usually performed in a multi-speaker space where each muscle group is sonified on a different speaker and we create then a spatialized and immersive sound environment as if we're going inside the muscular space of the arms. But as the piece goes on, we'll see that the inharmonic sounds of the electromyogram signal slowly become more harmonic. And so the composition of this piece is in fact to use the electromyogram as the raw excitation signal. Well, it, become, it is at the beginning the signal, the musical sound that we hear, but then it becomes an excitation for processes such as ring modulators and resonators and harmonizers. And so this is perhaps following that electric guitarist approach of layering on a network of effects to the original sound. Okay. So with that, let me dial up myogram here. That's uh, over here. We, in one max patch, I've got about 15 years of different pieces and they're, it's quite remarkable. The software holds up famous last words. Um, okay but they seem to interoperate. And if I click here, it should start and we'll get about 10 minutes of myogram.
Okay, so that was myogram. And I've got to make sure myogram is stopped now. Sonification of muscle and different processes layered on. Oh yeah, hold on, I went wrong. Here we go. Boom. So for the last piece, I want to bring us up to date with the current fascination current fascination with artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the signal such as the electromyogram seems ripe for these kinds of techniques. The signal is very complex. It's very difficult to deal with directly. It's a much livelier signal than the normal ways that we have to control electronic music, whether it's knobs and sliders, keyboards, or even other sensors. The electromyogram signal, it's as, as complex as the human voice, but then as we've heard, is very different than the human voice and is that it's inharmonic. Okay. It's aperiodic. It's a stochastic pulse string. So it requires a lot of signal massaging to get it to become a musically useful signal. So what the technologies of machine learning propose is that rather than hand massaging the signal, let the algorithm do it for you. Or so goes the proposition. And in order to do that, we may record a bunch of examples. And the more we record, the bigger the data set gets. And if we record for days and for multiple people, we might slowly get into a space of what today is called big data and have enough data to go into these techniques of deep learning. But I have not got a database of millions of people's muscle sensing, nor am I very interested in the normative effects that they might have. I'm interested in myself as a single body performing and to see whether some of these machine learning techniques might become interesting performance partners okay, in analyzing and processing the signal coming from the body to then get interesting mappings to sound coming out. So this is not big data, it's small data. I could then record a number of gestures and we could train a machine learning classifier to say, oh, you've done that gesture, you've done that gesture. But there's a problem with that as well. The classifier would tell me what the gesture was performed after the gesture is done. And I'm not very interested in that either. I'm interested, as I say, to interact directly in conversation with the algorithm. And so I don't want to wait for the algorithm to tell me what I've just done. I want the algorithm to be doing it with me as I do it. So instead of classification and recognition of different gestures, I use neural networks to create what are called regression models, to create different anchor points along the way that are examples of not gestures, but postures, okay. to allow then a neural network to, to create a model of an in, entire information space that uses these anchor points as pillars. And from there, to create an association between the information space of gesture and an information space of sound. Now, if I do that as a composition and walk on stage with the training set, my small data training set all done, what does the audience know? If I, I've got to tell them in the program that's that this is using um, uh, machine learning technologies, isn't that Gee whiz, wonderful. Um, but really, I'm interested to see what the interaction is in performance as we go and perhaps to expose the process of machine learning, 
that is providing examples, training, creating a model, and then performing with that model. And so in this last piece called de-learning, I will start with a blank data set, tabla rasa. I will start then with some sounds and let me get that going. Uh, let's see. So if we, yeah, okay. So this is the recording that I'm gonna use as the musical source. It's an orchestra piece. It's a chamber orchestra piece that I did years ago that will be used as the corpus. This will be imported into the synthesizer that is able to segment and analyze this corpus of sound based on its different auditory features and create an information space of sound based on timbre, amplitude, energy, and other metadata associated with sound. Okay. And slowly start to turn this down. I'm also gonna double check the recording over here. Okay. So this is to give you an idea of the source sounds. Okay. And I'll call up the piece now. then we'll take elements from the orchestra piece and we'll seem stuck on different moments but in these static moments you will see me do a posture and so in these moments the piece is going to be very clunky and I might, uh, this is my process of training the neural network. Okay. We'll hear other grains of sound and other postures. And then suddenly we'll get into running the trained data set and I'll start to perform more fluidly. The piece will progress as I add to this data set. And adding to the data set, retraining the model and re-performing is this iterative cycle that we call interactive machine learning. And so with this, de-learning.
Thank you. So that was de-learn. And now I'm going to get back to Zoom mode here. And we can have a little conversation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Atal. Um, one of the serious limitations of the Zoom context is that we can't really applaud you in the way that I'm sure we would uh, want to, but uh, here you get a, a pale version. That's okay. No one ever applauds anyway when I perform. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's As the true. joke goes. Yeah. I'm sure that's not true. Um, so thank you really. That was terrifically interesting and uh, great to hear such different implementations of the same uh, basic sensor technology at, at the heart of it. Um, if I could just start with, with uh, one kind of question, then I'll hand over to anyone who wants to ask questions or make comments or whatever. Um, I suppose for those of us who have, and it's probably many people who are in this Zoom meeting, um, who have learned a conventional instrument, um, I'm sure that we have all, we will all remember all too vividly in starting to learn an instrument, how awkward and difficult and what a barrier it seemed and how uncomfortable it was and how much at times we hated it. And the, the kind of um, image of a, of, a, of a kind of instrument in which that barrier is completely removed, in which there is a, what, what seems from the description to be a kind of completely transparent relationship between one's own movements and the production of sound seems like a kind of dream come true. But I wonder whether there is, at the same time as we realize then that instruments can feel like barriers to what we want to achieve, I think at, even at those early stages of learning, we also um, are all too aware of how, how they are facilitators, how they have these fantastic um, affordances, to, to use a word that you've been using quite a lot as well, uh, the, the fantastic affordances of instruments and the, and the possibilities and the facilitating role that they have. And I just wonder, with your long experience now of using your own body in this kind of um, sort of transparent way, if I can use that, that metaphor, um, whether how you feel about that relationship with but between uh, between the instrument as kind of impediment as as hurdle to be overcome and the instrument as possible uh, as the, the the kind of positive facilitator of sound and when you take that away what what do you feel you're left with oh, that's a very very good question and indeed it is one that is 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 really one of my preoccupations because i am myself originally a pianist, I eventually picked up the electric guitar, I played other instruments along the way. Um, so I enjoy instruments, but then to think about them as barriers or facilitators, whatever it is, we do have the notion that the effort that one invests has a return. And that the what may seem like transparent in my case because it's invisible doesn't mean that instrumental performance on traditional instruments doesn't become transparent at some moment. And I was quite interested in this very process. And when I started, this was the late, or the yeah, very late 80s, early 90s. And if you remember, this was the first wave of virtual reality technology. And especially in Silicon Valley, Jaron Lanier was there and the word virtual was sort of a buzzword. And so to not have a physical object, an instrument to play, it was very easy to jump on the virtual reality bandwagon and say, okay, I'm gonna make a virtual musical instrument. But then if you think about the definition of the word virtual, we think of well, virtual is something other than this real rea reality. But actually, if you look up the definition of the word in the dictionary, virtual means getting to the essence of something. And so perhaps what I was interested in by getting rid of the physical instrument into what seemed possibly transparent, perhaps I was interested to get to the essence of that instrumental performance practice, the investment, the effort that might come to a transparency. So the transparency with which I may be performing today, maybe it's thanks to the technology and the fact that I don't have an object I have to manipulate, but also I hope at some level, 
it is as in any other musician's case the fact that i've just been playing this instrument for 20 years mm. Mm. yeah great i'll hand over to anyone who now would like to um ask a question or make a comment perhaps yeah george uh, mine actually follows on quite neatly from that because i'm quite interested just in, in your practice of, and thank you for that it was it was uh, really really beautiful to see i was just um Thinking when you were playing myogram, uh, I was wondering the gestures that you make. Um, to what extent are they uh, planned, and how do you kind of? What's your sort of process for deciding what gestures to use, and, mm. and are there kind of elements of improvisation within that as well? Certainly, yeah. So this is the question of choreography, and choreography as a, a way to compose movement, uh, and and these technologies. Uh, are used um, in research fields called MOCO, movement computing, uh, by dancers. And often uh, people ask me, oh, have you tried this with a dancer? I have had tried, did some tests, or I've even walked on stage with sensor sonic sights and, the, and the, the sound engineer says, okay, well, let's get the musician set up and then how are we gonna do the lighting for the dancer in the middle? And so I've been confused as the dancer, uh, but I'm far from being a dancer. If you see my movements, uh, well, sometimes they're very awkward, uh, I'm not moving for the beauty of the, uh, of the bodily gesture. I'm making the gesture in order to articulate the sound. And there are certain positions of the body or certain gestures that get me to that sound. But I think all musical instruments can be like that. And we sometimes see saxophonists sort of digging in and people trying, instrumentalists trying to find that sweet spot. And so I have a similar relationship here with gesture, and I'm, so I'm not choreographing. I'm not composing the movement. The sound is composed. The, the ways that I, the mappings between my movement and sound are composed, or the, the evolution of the relationship, the association, in the case of the machine learning, between sound and gesture may be predetermined or may be emergent. Uh, with with uh, conversation with the machine learning algorithm, but all within all that, there's enormous space for improvisation. And the simplest uh, being uh, uh, the first two pieces. You know, in Lulu, the second piece, there's really only one sound. So truly, there isn't really a composition there. That is a, uh, a, a yeah, an improvisation. But since I've been playing that for about two decades. I sort of know that sound and I know the gestures that get me to certain spots in that sound. Uh, and so I can create a musical dramaturgy in performance. The lifting is, is also very simple, but it's composed of those three frequencies you know, and that's it. In myogram, it is the layering of effects okay, that is predetermined that is in a sequence of time but it's within each of those moments that the, the composition gets me to i have enormous interpretive uh, scope right thank you next any anyone else want to ask a question yeah john hi Atta. thank you so much for the performance that was absolutely fantastic great thank you um, I guess uh, my question kind of follows on as well, which is um, I'm interested maybe in the risk in performance. So mm. when you're performing, like what, what are the limits of like what's acceptable as a sonic result of your actions? Like, does that change in, in different pieces or with different mm. kind of instrument mappings or the interfaces? Um, yeah, I'm interested in kind of, um, when you feel like it's going a different way to how, how you're wanting, what does that look like? Or what does that sound mm. like? How mm. do you interpret that? Yeah, so risk and limits, these are, these are excellent questions because these are all things that I, I think about. Or um, well, the risk and the limit today was your laptop speaker, if you're listening through your laptop. <laughs> Um, and that is a joke, but it's not a joke because the risk and limit for an electric guitarist is to bend that note, but to bend too much 
and then the string breaks. And we all know we don't want to break that string, but we all know that there's this kind of exponential energy as that string gets taut and bent up and we're, we're getting trying to slide up to that uh, note. Uh, and if we go too far, it is going to break that string. But if we get to that uh, li limiting point, there's an enormous amount of energy. And I'm looking for that with digital systems. Um, and so, and this is something that digital and computer systems aren't really set up to do because computer systems essentially are trying to give you environments that are reproducible. You know, and to try to give you uh, setups, configurations that are safe. Okay. And often uh, we hear a lot about interpolation okay, in, in electronic music and digital music systems. I've got this point, I've got that point. I want to make a curve between the two. That's all good and fine, and the neural network allows that. But that neural network that I was allowing interpolate, creates a model connecting the anchor points that I've given it, but it doesn't stop there. I can go beyond that anchor point and therefore extrapolate. And I'm quite interested, uh, not just in interpolation, but extrapolation. But with extrapolation, the sound might very well blow up. But to have that possibility uh, and in the program is something that I leave in or that I don't bother to take out as the risk and energetic uh, element. Great, thank you. Yeah, you did. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your lecture performance. Um, I was also quite fascinated by the choreography aspect of your performances. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, so you said you don't consider yourself a dancer, but right. um, as you as you uh, grew with these um, performance techniques, did you feel that you gained a heightened sense of physical and body awareness? And yes. I guess what would be really interesting for me as well is uh, compared to your experiences as a pianist, which though it seems very intellectual is actually a very, has, has a very big physical component as well. Mm. How does mm. it compare? Is it, is it more the intellectual intent or the physicality of it in your performances now? Yeah. So this has to do with uh, body awareness, perhaps uh, questions of proprioception. Um, but connecting to the piano, yes, I think the piano is very, very visceral. Uh, and this, we get to the phenomenology of, of, of performance in that you, you, you start a piano piece by reading the notes, by learning the piece, and then We'll, I'll skip a few steps, but people often start to talk about muscle memory. And then, well, we can memorize the piece, but somehow our body knows where to go and not hit the wrong note. Yeah. And I think that's a kind of a phenomenal moment. Uh, and similarly, by playing this same body instrument for years, I have gotten to know my body like an instrumentalist might get to know their instrument. Uh, so um, I do, at some level through experience, know when I'm getting somewhere. Uh, but uh, maybe what I'm tuned into is not, as you say, intellectually, oh, I, I shouldn't have my arm too far over here and then uh, uh, rotate it because then that will cause a carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, these aren't thoughts that go through your head as you're performing. Uh, there is a direct uh, proprioceptive um, and, and, and um, yeah, phenomenological relationship with what's happening. Okay. Uh, that, that is, that is a entirely embodied experience. Um, I'm not feeling particularly articulate now. It's the end of a long day. Um, I hope this is making sense. But um, this, to then have that relationship uh, with the body, a kind of awareness, 
and then having that be directly articulated in sound then creates the feedback loop for me. Okay? And this is perhaps where not having a physical object as musical instrument, I rely on the sound as the feedback channel. I don't have a thing to press on to know what are the limits of where uh, the boundaries of where my body can go. And if sometimes I'm known to play on large sound systems, it's not just to blow everyone's ears, but it is to get enough acoustical, physical energy coming back that I, I have uh, uh, a palpable uh, experience uh, that, that gives me the feedback um, that I need. Now, the closest thing, I'm not a dancer, but I do practice yoga. And this has been really quite, uh, yeah, um, enlightening for me to think about energy centers, awareness. Yeah. I'm quite interested in Tai Chi as well, but haven't had time to get into it. So some of these uh, practices of the body, I think, are, are quite relevant. And in that sense, perhaps I am more interested in that than Laban choreographic notation and, and, and learning. As much as I uh, love contemporary dance, I'm not uh, a trained or, or training myself in that direction. Instead, I do have a regular yoga practice that then gets me uh, looking within. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, John. Hello. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, just, um, I've noticed we've spent kind of a lot of discussion talking about dance, um, mm. uh, the choreography that's involved um, with your work. Uh, and I just remembered um, at the start of your lecture performance, you, know, you mentioned that one of the first instances that you came across this music uh, was on a CD. Um, Yes. So it's really quite a rudimentary question, um, but just how important do you feel it is that, uh, that an audience is able to actually see the performer? Um, mm. And kind of the whole relationship between sound and sound, uh, yeah. that affects yeah. it. Uh, so yeah, so music, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and certainly the Zoom performance uh, uh, compromises the situation greatly, uh, but something nonetheless survives. I hope. And, and so something definitely survived when I heard Michelle Weiss's on CD. Right. Uh, but it's for this very reason that you point out, because it's physical, and because by it being physical, it is visual. Uh, it is a music that I didn't record for a long time. I didn't think that the, the recorded medium was the best uh, uh, channel um, for the music. It was a music to be performed live. But then, if that music then in, has within it that visceral energy, it has a chance to survive a medium, I think. But when you're there in the concert hall, then you're in the feedback loop. The audience is in the feedback loop that I was describing to you, Jeff. That uh, if I've got a kind of corporal effort that I'm giving that manifests in sound, that then is transduced into acoustical air pressure that comes back to me viscerally as a sensation of what I'm doing, that's the, the big feedback loop that goes th from the body through the electronics into acoustic space and back. And that acoustic space in a concert then is a social and public space. So the audience then is inside the feedback loop. And so whether you are there with sensors doing it, knowing how to play an instrument or not, I think this is the sensation of a concert and this is what Christopher Small calls musicking, that uh, even listening to music, or not even, by using the word even, I've already made a mistake, but the act of listening to music is as engaged as the act of playing music. And in this case, 
being an audience in this in a in a concert of muscle music uh, puts the audience in the very proprioceptive feedback loop of the performer. And in um, neuroscience, we have these theories of mirror neurons. By simply watching someone make uh, an act, uh, uh, the theory is that similar brain areas are activated in, in, in uh, watching uh, the act. And so these are all the steps through which a certain imagination may be transmitted and directly experienced. And this is something I'm starting to uh, think about uh, in, in, um, through the word intersubjectivity. And I'm really quite interested in, and I'm kind of uh, working on this at the moment. Um, um, and it was, um, it was in fact at Georgina Bourne's uh, a conference, um, uh, Kasabian, she, she was right talking about intersubjectivity uh, then. And that's, that's what got me starting uh, to think about it. Um, uh, in her case, it was, I think, creating intersubjective uh, aesthetic spaces. In my case, it is thinking about intersubjectivity as ways of creating shared visceral experience through uh, sound. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we have been going for quite a long time, and I think that the, the, it seems to me that the, the that having arrived at intersubjectivity and the, 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 the number of us here who are all intersubjectively engaged with you um, at our is a, is a great moment to stop and to say once again, thank you so much for for your for the talk, for the ideas, for the performance, for the great sounds, and um, and actually it's a it's a it's a curiously appropriate way to be finishing um, this uh, first virtual um, Empress Art of Noises Festival, since you have been talking a lot about, about the virtual. So it's, it's V for both five and V for virtual in this um, Empress Art of Noises event. And V for visceral. And V for visceral, thank you. Yes, yes. V for visceral as well. Good. And talk, talking of visceral, we, we are very much hoping that um, we will be able to get you to come and indeed give an in real life um, concert here in, in, in Oxford when, when the conditions allow and that that will allow those of us who are in Oxford, all those of us who come to Oxford, um, mm -hmm. to, to witness this in a, in a rather more expansive kind of space. But um, well, we, once again, that would be a pleasure. Yeah. Well, it would be great to have you. And once again, can I, on behalf of us all, thank you very much indeed for a, a really great evening. And um, we hope to see you again before too long. That's Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for setting this up and running uh, everything on that end. Um, it's a real pleasure to see some familiar faces and, um, and some new ones. The, the questions have been excellent. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Great. Right.